Good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Hoshida. I'm the staff development officer for the district. Um, I'm also an English faculty at Berkeley City College. Um, I use the pronouns he, him, and they, there, whatever. Um, and I want to welcome you to the beginning of spring 2020, the new decade. The new decade, the new year. We have a lot of new beginnings today. Um, before we get started, I really want to make sure I say thank you to um, all the folks that really make an event like today happen. Someone had written to me and said, oh, to Scott and your elves. And they are kind of magical in that they are behind the scenes and, and don't get a lot of credit. Um, so in Merit, there's Jane Fong, Tara Morero, Dale Nabetta, Maria Suarez Rodriguez. Um, the AV, we can give a hand. Yes, thank you, Merit folks. And many others who I probably didn't uh, mention, so I'm sorry. Uh, AV Tech, we have Diana Fitzgerald, Angel Hunter, Jim, Cecilia. Catering is Alfred from Laney, June Kim from Fresh and Natural. And, and the Academic Affairs team, who um, really supports me. I've learned a great deal about um, the amount of work that they take on in the office um, to support all the work that happens at the colleges. It's hidden. I um, mean, it's super important. I really appreciate um, Shinova, Nishan, Laura, Constance, and Michael Moore in the coffee room. So give them, give everyone a round of applause. Um, as you look through the program, there's a lot of different um, activities going on. And I think um, all the people who are participating are showing a bit of leadership. Um, an interest in kind of sharing what they've learned and what their knowledge is and, and kind of trying to inspire each other. And I feel like in Peralta, we have a lot of that going on, more than sometimes we'd like to admit. And so it's super important that when you go to the workshops, you know, thank people. Spend the time to, to really appreciate them. So just to tell you a quick little story, uh, I was at a meeting and people were talking about their intentions for the year. And one person stood up, she said, I'm going to, I'm going to, give myself permission to have a little bit of hope this year. And my initial reaction was, well, what about that this last year was the second most, the hottest, you know, on record, the second hottest on record. We have these impeachment hearings. We have this housing crisis. Like all these issues that kind of are, you know, overwhelming to me and to, you know, just thinking about how we kind of feel about the world. Um, and then I was thinking more locally in Peralta. We have all, obviously the FICMAT and the reports um, we have negotiations happening, and there's a lot of really um, difficult things happening. But then as I was kind of thinking back about um, all the times, I spend time going to each of the campuses and talking to um, the professional development committees, people trying to do work. It's an integrated group of staff, faculty, administrators trying to put things on. And I realize there's actually a lot of cool things happening, a lot of intentions that are out there and that we have to kind of keep cultivating that. There's a lot of stuff that that's we can build on. Um, and with that kind of idea in mind, I wanted to post intentions here. So these sheets, if you didn't get one, they're right to the right of the Huey P. Newton painting. Um, you can think about your intentions either for the year or the decade, and we're gonna hang them up, and I'll take some pictures of them. They, they're anonymous. Um, in the past, I've done other ways of engaging people, like raffles, that was not good. Um, I did gratitude cards where we asked people to write gratitudes to people that, who they thought really had helped them and supported them. And that went around really great. I sent them out to people, they wrote them down. Um, and then last year I did, or this, this fall, I did something where we did some values work, we talked about the values that we want to bring when we work together. So this intention wall is to kind of at least take one little glimmer of an intention for the year. It doesn't have to be big, it can be outlandish, it can be whatever you want it to be, to put it out there for ourselves. So please do it and we'll have a chance to take a look at that. All right, um, let's go do a quick overview of the day and then we'll launch into our um, welcomes. So um, just the morning plenary goes until about hopefully 10.45, their shared governance welcomes. Can we go to the next slide, please? This is not working. Uh, the chance, our new chance will give an address. Um, and then a lot of times after the chancellor's address, people run. But we have this amazing 
performance that's going to happen by Gritty City Youth Theater. So it's not going to be talking heads and PowerPoints. It is going to be something that you will feel, and I'll have my, my mentor and colleague Janine come and introduce them. Um, after that, we'll have breakout sessions in the late morning, lunch, and then two afternoon breakouts. And you can see that all in the program. Okay? Um, so, let's get started with the shared governance welcomes. Um, so, if I could invite, uh, I think Richard is not able to make it to uh, today, but Alejandro, uh, Jennifer Schnosky, and Donald Moore to come up. We'll have them come do introductions. Um, please give them a hand. These are leaders who are working to support the work that we do um, and participate in this. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to 2020. Um, I am the Vice President of the Peralta Classified Senate. My name is Alejandro. and. Uh, Terrence Fisher, who's the president, wasn't able to be here, so he asked me to come say welcome to everyone. I want to particularly welcome all the classified professionals that are able to make it here today. And uh, just, you know, we have a newly elected um, uh, executive uh, team of the Peralta Classified Senate. Um, myself, Terrence, Roberto Gonzalez is our uh, parliamentarian, and then Doris Hankins is our treasurer. And, you know, um, I just want to say to all the classifieds who are here, um, please come to the meetings. We're going to try to be switching it to rotating, uh, holding the meetings between the four campuses to make it easier for folks to come and participate. Um, you know, as Scott uh, alluded to, um, in the world in general and in you know Peralta right now specifically, we're in like a big uh, moment um, of change of like hopefully new exciting things that are on the horizon. And um, it's really important for us, uh, all of our constituencies, you know, um, to be around the table, to uh, try to reach consensus and try to like, you know, put, um, to, to just get our input into the process moving forward so it can be like the best possible outcomes for, uh, for the institution as a whole. Um, uh, Richard um, Thole, the 10 to 1 president, wasn't able to be here, I just found out. Um, and I'm, a, I'm a steward at Laney College, so I'd also say um, on behalf of 1021, you know, we're getting ready to uh, begin contract negotiations. Um, so also classifieds, um, take that survey if you haven't already, and just, uh, you know, uh, be looking out for updates on the negotiation process as it begins. Uh, thank you. Hey, good morning. Uh, Happy New Year to the faculty, staff, administrators, and I saw some students out there in the audience. Um, I'm really happy to be back at Merit today. Uh, I miss being here at Merit. I miss the faculty, I miss the staff, I miss the administration, and I miss the view every day. Um, but most of all, I really miss the students that I've had the privilege to serve um, in the years that I've been here at Merit. Uh, when I first applied to a full-time job here at Merritt, I actually did it on a whim. It came up as a listing. I had another job that I had already been accepted for, um, and I was, I was set to work somewhere else. But when I came here for my interview, I was about 20 minutes early. This might make me cry. I was about 20 minutes early, and I was walking through the parking lot, and I met a couple of students. And so I just asked them, hey, Tell me about Merit. I didn't really know anything about Merit. And they described this place as home. And they described the faculty and the staff as people that really felt like family to them, and this as an institution that had really changed their lives. And that, as well as my interview and the interactions that I had with the faculty and staff here during that day, changed the course of my career. And so I did not go to the other institution, and I, and I came here. Um, I really wanted to be a part of what those students felt so strongly about. And I think all faculty and staff that I've had you know, the pleasure of, of interacting with feel the same way. We all want to be part of that feeling. It's why we come here. It's why we figure out creative ways to get what our students need despite the many, many obstacles that stand in all of our ways. It's why we work in classrooms and offices that are falling apart, that are often too hot or too cold or leak. 
It's why we continue to participate in meetings and committees and why we continue to hope for a better outcome with each new set of administrators that come through the door with new ideas and new plans. In the last month, our administration has ordered hundreds of sections to be cut from our schedules with more to be cut next year. We're removing class offerings, many that have sizable enrollments, from our schedules in an attempt to be more productive. We're treating our colleges like businesses, and we're doing that to the detriment of the programs and of our students. We're treating our workers, faculty, and staff alike like disposable cogs in the productivity wheel. I'm not naive. I do understand that we cannot run our colleges without the funding that comes directly from our students and those headcounts. But I can also look at data, and I can read all of the reports that we've seen. And I think it's important that we do continue to question the decisions that are being made based on the facts that we have available to us. The, the executive summary of the FICMAT report that we've heard so much about is two full pages long. Productivity and enrollment do appear, of course, we know that this is a problem, but they appear in two out of the 15 paragraphs. So I encourage you to read through that entire report. When I looked at comparisons from the da state's data on productivity, I see that productivity around the state is low and that we're actually right in the middle of the Bay 10. We're not as bad as what we're being told. We also see that our funding in dollars per FTES from our general fund are right in the middle of the state. We're 30th out of 72 districts in terms of funding dollars per FTES. That does not include categorical funds, and it doesn't include the parcel tax money that taxpayers in our community generously gave us to support more classes, not less. I could go on and on with comparisons and data that indicate that we're being told a story that isn't quite true. But I'll just say this, faculty and staff are not the source of Peralta's woes. The problem lies with short-sighted decisions made again and again far away from the students and the people who know them best, faculty and staff. Faculty are in an unnecessary labor dispute. We're fighting over $600,000. We've been working under an expired contract since July 1st. It is vital that we settle this contract now and allow the groups that work with students every single day to be able to focus on the work that we do of making our colleges what we know them to fundamentally be. Folks laughed when I said this in the fall, and I will dare to say it again. I remain an optimist. That's why I came to Peralta, and I know it's why many of my brothers and sisters on the faculty and staff came here too. And maybe that's why I'm hopeful that we can work with our new chancellor and her team to help them learn about the real strengths and real weaknesses of this wonderful, if sometimes frustrating, place. With hard work and a commitment to what matters, we can build the district and colleges that our students deserve. Thank you for your time, and have a great semester. Good morning, everyone. Uh, <laughs> I see the storm has come in full force now. Uh, double check your classrooms to see if there's any water coming down and that type of stuff. But uh, let's. I want to. Uh, I want to extend a. Uh, uh, a hand of collegial engagement uh, with our new chancellor, uh, Dr. Regina uh, stanbeck Stroud. I want the Academic Senate to work cooperatively with the Board of Trustees, the Chancellor, the Vice Chancellors, and the College Presidents. Uh, work with us, let us provide you with our collective advice on academic matters. For the past decade, uh, we have changed our practices to uh, be more student-centered. Uh, we have changed our online platform. We have changed our student placement processes. We have incentivized students to jump 
right into college level math and English uh, with the requirement that we provide more tutoring and counseling uh, support to be more student success focused. More recently, a major change has been in how we fund, uh, how to maximize uh, certificates, transfer, graduation rates, how to encourage students to have six units, to, to take nine units, to take 12 units, to take 16 units. These overall changes have been difficult or to keep many, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, have been difficult um, whether to drop other lower courses or to keep, uh, to keep the lower courses, uh, particularly in, um, in English. Uh, each of our colleges have made decisions on how to address and implement these changes. As uh, are we doing the deeper dive in assessing the effectiveness and efficiency of these changes? Do we have the resources to provide some level of the wraparound services many of our students need. Our, uh, as, as our colleges gear up to map their students' ability to graduate or to earn that certificate in a year or two years, how do we engage the faculty for students to not only take the lectures and the labs, but to take all of the courses along their pathway? The Academic Senate has been and will continue to provide support for all of these issues, whether at the college level with all the issues uh, uh, around administrative support, <clears throat> having adequate number of administrators, academic chairs, working with deans to ensure courses are being staffed at the last moment. Uh, at the State Senate, they have provided more workshops, um, institutes, and so forth uh, like AB 705 workshops, guided pathway workshops, accreditation workshops, and more. In the coming months and years, we, the collective we, uh, need to get uh, us out of the fiscal mess that we're in, and that's the plan that we're uh, involved in right now. Uh, we need to resolve the issues that our union is currently negotiating. I hear the frustrations of our faculty I say this because all of this impacts our teaching and the focus on students that we all want. Thank you. I want to introduce our new chancellor, Dr. Regina Stanbach Stroud. She has an enormous amount of experience in the California Community College System. I think it's appropriate that we're at Merit, um, where we have a nursing program, because she started off as a professor of nursing, has worked as a dean, a vice president of instruction, and as a president. And I think um, in addition to that, she's worked at the state academic senate level. She has a great deal of knowledge about um, some of the policies that we are trying to debate about and discuss. Um, and she's also built an equity institute at Skyline that I know a number of our, my colleagues have gone and had great things to report at. I know another group is actually heading there this spring. Um, and I would just like to say um, I would love to give her a very warm welcome. Um, to the middle of the semester, and I'm sure that she'll have a much bigger kind of send off or kick off at the beginning of next semester, but I want to thank you for coming in to being willing to speak today. So if you could help me in welcoming um, Dr. Gina Sandberg Stroud, our new chancellor. Thank you, thank you so much. <clears throat> the first thing I'd like to do is start off with uh, thanking Merritt College for being such a gracious host. Um, it requires work to do this kind of stuff. And when it requires that kind of work, it means that you have to kind of clean up, get the house in order, and even when it's family, we know that you put a lot into it. So thank you very much, Mary Collett. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. The next thing I'd like to do is just acknowledge the leadership uh, throughout the district. The leadership is the faculty, uh, uh, the collective bargaining leadership for the different um, organizing groups, also the uh, faculty uh, academic senate, the classified senate as well, the student leadership. I'd like to particularly acknowledge the executive leadership. I have the pleasure of working with Dr. Siri Brown, who is the vice chancellor of academic services, Chanel Whitaker, who is the interim Vice Chancellor of Human Resources. I have the pleasure of working with uh, Vice Chancellor, I mean, yeah, Vice Chancellor Min Lam, uh, as well, the Director of Marketing, uh, Public Relations, Communications and Public Relations, uh, and also Vice Chancellor Lee Sata. So 
Uh, thank you so much to the executive leadership and all of the district staff uh, that are there uh, supporting us. And then a special thanks to the staff in my office. The staff in my office, even though yesterday <clears throat> they did a little bit of a intervention on me. So they say I have a problem with pen theft, but uh, actually it's not true, okay? But uh, Brenda did say to me that the first step is admitting it. <laughs> so for many of you, it's our, opportunity, it's our first opportunity to meet. Uh, and so it's my pleasure to be able to be here. Uh, some of you had an opportunity, I had a chance to meet with you in the forums, but for those of you who I didn't, I just wanna tell you a little bit about me. Uh, as Scott said, I am a registered nurse. I continue to be a registered nurse. When I went into administration, I decided that I needed to give myself tenure. I have employable skills, so I continue to keep my license. But the reality is, it's part of my identity. Uh, <clears throat> and I did work as a dean, a vice president um, of instruction, a dean of uh, workforce and economic development, and as a college president. And then I went on uh, to retire after 35 years in a, uh, from a very good district uh, in this system. Uh, and my intention was to, I'm, I'm a little bit of a Francophile, so I, I'm a wannabe, okay. I, my language is terrible, but uh, my intention was to retire and to spend time in Paris uh, because I frequent there. Uh, I go there frequently. And uh, I did just that, seven weeks. I was in Europe and got a call from uh, Bryce Harris and uh, told me about this uh, opportunity. And in speaking with my uh, wife, we decided we're Oaklanders, this is our community, and we would go uh, and make sure that we had an opportunity to contribute to our community. So I went from Paris to Peralta in seven short weeks, and I'm glad to be here. <laughs> <clears throat> the other thing is I, I just do wanna share that I you know, have particular interests, uh, and those interests, while, um, they're comprehensive, some of the things that I really uh, spend some of my leisure time on and, uh, and professional time is uh, science. Um, I'm on a few boards that are related to science, the Base 11 board, which is the um, uh, automatic uh, drone technology uh, system. I'm on the MaxGrad board, which is a technological board. I'm on the Sierra Nevada Journeys, which is a outdoors-based science education. Um, experience and anybody who knows me <clears throat> knows that uh, my idea of camping is a bad room at the Claremont so uh, <laughs> they're wondering how on earth I got to that but I've been very committed to it. I also am very committed to anti-poverty and social justice and in uh, looking so I've had the opportunity to do lots of different things including starting spark points and creating promise programs uh, serving as a presidential appointee to uh, President Barack Obama uh, and um, engaging in a lot of work around critical race. Um, and then I'm also interested in world peace. Uh, and that gets translated into my work in international uh, awareness. I'm a Delta Sigma Theta and part of that is, which is a black, collegiate organi uh, cl black organization of collegiate women where we are committed to the, uh, supporting the African American community. And in doing so, I chair the International Awareness and Involvement Committee, and we work to increase people's awareness of international opportunities because I ultimately do believe that when you are exposed to other cultures and you get to enjoy the majesty of those cultures, that you get to see the humanity, that it's just very hard to think about killing people. So I absolutely do believe that the key to world peace is our own international awareness and involvement. So I entered Peralta Community College and uh, got very quickly, um, didn't take long to get a good, good picture of what's going on. There's a lot of outside negative noise and that outside negative noise tends to drown out all that's positive that's in Side the district. And so what we find is that the outside community gets to hear precisely what we, and see precisely what we allow uh, and that that we may not intend. And with that outside negative noise, then it means that uh, news media will pick up certain things. Uh, it means that we see what's happening 
but we don't see the whole story. Uh, much like you got today, where you heard a certain perspective, but you haven't heard the whole story. So, so once you're inside and you witness some of the things, then that's where you have the opportunity to be able to make the changes, be committed to the preservation of the institution, and that's precisely what uh, I made a commitment to do. I saw amazing programs and services. I saw students who were willing to persevere. I saw people who come here and dedicate their life's work to preserving the institution. So, let's move right in. We are facing a lot of challenges. One of the things you will hear about is the FITMAC. And the FITMAC is the Financial Crisis Management Assistance Team, which is a support service that, that actually Peralta called in and said, take a look at us. And they look at you through about uh, 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 maybe a little over 125 standards. And they ask you questions and then give you a score based on how you've answered those questions or been able to produce the evidence. If you have a score of about 40%, then it's considered to be, you're considered to be at pretty high risk of fiscal insolvency. Peralta's score was 69%. So they uh, also, Peralta called in CBT and said, well, give us some recommendations. We need to fix that. CBT came in and, and gave us some recommendations as well. We're working on both of those recommendations. But that got the attention of the Accrediting Commission. And they said, if you're at 69% on your FICMAC, then you need to give us a five-year sustainability plan, how you're going to sustain yourself fiscally. So we had to develop a five-year sustainability plan. Much of the work was done before I arrived. But when I arrived on October the 21st, we had received the FITMAT recommendations in July. From July to October, the end of October, we had shifted probably about six of those standards maybe six of those standards out of 90. And then in three weeks, I had to say to the commission how successful or unsuccessful we were in meeting those standards. So we went into high gear, focused on it, and in three weeks, shifted to where we got 50% of the standards shifted to favorable. <laughs> Now, the reason, that's, the reason that's significant is because if the Accrediting Commission, which I have to go before today, this evening, if the Accrediting Commission has confidence that Peralta is really doing well and, and will be able to do what it says it's going to do and will follow through, then the Accrediting Commission uh, accepts us and we don't have an untoward impact on our accreditation. If they have no confidence in us, then that's the next step where they say to us, you need to show us calls why you should even maintain your accreditation. So my phone call this evening with them is a vital one. The focus that we have had has been on these things. So I haven't quite been on the listening tour and the, those types of things that I really would have enjoyed doing, though that's coming. Uh, and in speaking with the accrediting folks, when I spoke with Stephanie Droker, she said to me, Regina, if you can show them, if, if Peralta can get to where you've at least made 50% headway, the, the, I'm sure the commission will have confidence. I'll let you know how that conversation goes, but I will tell you that we did get to at least 50% headway. The other thing that I'd like to um, talk a little bit about is, excuse me, Part of those recommendations including review of the organization. And in doing so, we built on some work that was done before I got here. I think the PBIM did a summit and talked about what it needed in terms of centralized versus decentralized services, the, um, among other things. Then the PBIM work group came together and developed some design principles that they asked the executive leadership to keep in mind when we are looking at the organization of the district. And then the executive leadership has been engaged in some processes 
And in those processes, the executive leadership has looked at what will be centralized and decentralized. And I'll give you a heads up. You probably will have seen the effects. We're looking at decentralizing financial aid so that the services that the students need to access are closest to the students, so on the campuses. So financial aid and ultimately A&R. Uh, we're looking at, at centralizing some of the things like facilities and maintenance and IT. And that has a lot to do with being able to organize priorities. For an example, when Merit's power went out, uh, because the services are decentralized, uh, people could literally be standing right beside each other, but phone calls had to be made over here in order to get supervisors to say to the two different people, you know, that they were, you know, how, how they might collaborate in order to accomplish something in the middle of this emergency. Uh, and so looking at the uh, services, we're looking at centralizing facilities and maintenance. Um, the other thing that is big is the enrollment decline. Uh, over the last five years, the Peralta Community College District has lost around 30% of its enrollment. That is significant. That is very significant. Uh, and in doing so, the productivity has gone down. And I happen to know a little something about productivity, and productivity is really the measure by which we determine the, uh, how you're doing in terms of the fiscal responsibility. Uh, this fiscal stewardship of the resources you get from the state. So if you look at, I'll give you an example, if I teach a class and Dr. Brown teaches a class, if I have 30 students in my class and she has two students on a, in a class, we both get same, paid the same amount for that class. However, uh, I'm considered to be much more productive. Sorry, Siri. In my example, I'm considered to be much more productive. Now, it is not a cut and dry thing that way. For an example, you make sure you stay a comprehensive community college. You make sure programs and services are able to be done. You make sure students are able to be complete degrees. So it actually is a little bit of an art, uh, and that is part of the responsibility in the, in the room of moral management. So when you look at issues of productivity, um, it's a little bit more than the number. Uh, it's so many other things so that students can get degrees and certificates. And yes, we will pay attention to that. And yes, we will right-size these institutions because in the course of those 30% decrease, the institution has hired an additional 48 faculty. And yes, we will pay attention to that. We are 70 over the fund. And it doesn't mean that everything is done on the backs of faculty as it was as alluded to, but it means that it is part of the process as well. So yes, we will be meeting those recommendations and those recommendations are around us right-sizing the institution. And, and with that comes a fiscal monitor that's paying attention to whether we're doing the very hard things that have to be done. So it is unfortunate and I have, um, I'm, I'm remorseful that uh, this is the culture and climate that we have, but it is. I'm, I'm hopeful that we will get through it because I think the, dessert, the community deserves so much better. Hell, I think people in this room deserve better than what they're seeing right now. <clears throat> and when you have that kind of an enrollment decline, it's a chance for us to look at things like, why is that? Is it because, I mean, we, we have lots of reasons. The economy is better, uh, there's gentrification. There are lots of very legitimate reasons. But it's also an opportunity for us to look at ourselves. What is it about us, our practices, processes, and procedures that impacts an ability for the students and the community to be able to get in, get through, and get out on time? What is it about us? Hold up that mirror. Is your curriculum relevant? Are we do we have the programs that the community needs? Do they match to some of the things where if students need to be able to, or community members need to be able to access certain workforce? Do we have the mechanism for them to be able to do that? Do we have the relationships that we need to have? So it's not reduced to the utilitarianism of economic and workforce development. There is actually something that is a benefit in order for us to be liberally educated and for us to be able to think critically but in the meantime, the mortgage's got to be paid, or the rent's got to be paid, or the children have to be fed. And so our community, while we come to work every day, 
and we come from our nice homes, we come from, get out of our cars, we come to our jobs, and we receive our salaries. We have community members and students who are trying to make it off of $15,000 a year in this Bay Area. So it means that we have to look at ourselves as well. So what about our success, our track record? Across the nation, about 26% of the people who go to community colleges are able to get what they came for. They get the degrees and certificates, all right? At Peralta, it's different. Uh, if you look at it in two or three years. If, if you look at it in two or three years across the nation, it's about 26%. If you look at it uh, about across the nation in six years, it's even more. In Peralta, in six years, half the students who come here for a degree or certificate, half will get it in six years, all right? But if I take it down to two years to three years, is single digits. And what that means is, let's, let's be generous, let's say it's 9%. Let's go to the highest single digit, that is 9%, and it's not, it's much lower. But let's say it's 9% of the students who come to Peralta who want a degree or certificate or transfer do so in two to three years. Let's say it's that. That means 91% of the people who come here for a degree or certificate or to transfer do not in three years. So from my perspective, there needs to be some different signs held up in this room. And that gets me to the culture of the institution. Uh, I, I, I have to admit, I understand the regular structural tensions of higher education for between administration and faculty and staff and students. And there are regular structural tensions. And then there's Peralta. I have to acknowledge there are challenges but this is not rocket science. We've seen this movie before. We know how we can get to the end of some of these issues. Some of it is settled science. Some of it is a nice art. But we know how we can get to the end of some of these issues. But I also want to acknowledge that there is a level of meanness, disrespect, and contempt, and vitriol that gets spewed in this district that impacts the culture. It impacts what we have to work in every day. It means people have to come to work every day and experience it, regardless of where they are. When I introduced myself to this district, it was through an email while I was having to call on our better selves to understand and respect and have compassion for the humanity of us. That regardless of the constituency group you were in, from my perspective, that's somebody's mother, that's somebody's sister, that's somebody's uncle, that's somebody's brother. And we have the opportunity to model something different. We have the opportunity to model excellence and professionalism and respect instead of contempt and vitriol. And we also have the right to ask of ourselves and our colleagues to not turn our workplace and our place where we make our commitments into that type of a place. We have a right to that. None of us have to be apologetic for the work that we do. If you are a classified professional, it is honorable work. If you are a faculty member, it is honorable work. If you are an administrator, it is honorable work. And I will tell you, I am unapologetic about it. I am unapologetic about it, and I am appreciative of it all. It takes all of us in this village. It takes all of us. So how do we create a sense of respect and a sense of belonging? I want us to be careful that you don't take pride in your citizen just because you're clumsy with your power and because you lack the critical 
consciousness and racial literacy that you do not get to escape. I am a critical race scholar. It is not lost on me who is making the attacks and to whom is being, uh, and who is being attacked. It is not lost on me and it may not be intentional, but you don't have the luxury of ignoring it. So I want you to look around right now and see who's standing. Look around right now and see who's standing. Thank you, sister, in the back. I think there's one sister in the back. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not necessarily, yeah, I'm not trying to invalidate your participation. I'm saying that even I, even you, don't have the luxury of not paying attention to the racial dynamics that occur in this district, and it's not just about this. So, in terms of the culture, there are lots of different things, and I'm looking forward. I, too, like Jennifer, am optimistic. That's why I come here every day. Uh, I am looking forward to the change, in, and I have a vision for the change in Peralta. But I do want to give you, uh, alert you to the fact that one of the things that I believe that contributes to this maintenance of this culture is uh, we have not gotten our email systems in place or intact. Uh, right now, everybody can send everything to everybody across the district. <sighs> the result is your inboxes get filled with anything from fundraising to sales um, to the, the uh, rant or, or uh, vitriol. You have public disparagement of individuals in the district. My favorite uh, example <laughs> is before I, I, I got an email address before I came, and even in trying to figure out, ooh, is this someplace I want to go, there was an email that was from somebody who was uh, frustrated with their uh, a mistake in their payroll, and by the time I finished reading the email, it had, bitch, better have my money. I come from, from whence I come, just doesn't happen, just impossible. And that was just the beginning. And I believe people got those emails. It went to everybody in the district. And I believe people opened those emails and started their day like that. Um, the creation of this excessive vitriol uh, is facilitated by our system. So one of the things that we want to look at is making sure the district email is for district business. Now, there is a lot of dissemination also of misinformation, and it's just hard to keep up with. I'll be honest and tell you that I'm, I'm at the point of, you know, kind of how you deal with Trump stuff. You just, you can't even answer it anymore, you know. So there's a lot of misinformation, and it has li liability for us. For an example, when the power went out, some uh, a staff member in the library at one of the colleges decided to send out an all-district email telling everybody what they needed to do which was a surprise because it has implications. Like suppose somebody doesn't show up to work because they got that email thinking it's the official message. So we, we'll, we're gonna fix that. What we wanna do is make sure one, all of the constituents have the opportunity to hear from and receive information from their leaders. So that means Local 39 will be able to email all of its constituents. PFT will be able to email all of its constituents. Uh, the academic senates at the colleges will be able to email the faculty at the colleges. The, the classified senates will be able to email the classified, etc. So those permissions will stay. The second thing is for people who want to engage in the, what, what I call the community conversations, whether it's the, you know, Girl Scout cookies for sale to I don't like this policy, blah, blah, blah. We're gonna set up listservs and everybody who wants to opt in can opt in and you can get all that you want. And those who don't want that coming across their email don't have to opt in and you don't have to get any of it. <laughs> so 
so we'll be looking at that in the next 30 days. So, you know, that's, that's some hard stuff. You know, all of those comments are the not so fun things, but there's some fun stuff. There's some, uh, as Jennifer calls it, optimism that we can keep hope alive. I think leadership matters. I think it matters at all levels. I happen to be an expert on this one, uh, but I think it matters at all letters, all levels. And so I asked this team to show up differently. I don't believe we have the luxury of mediocrity. I think people are counting on us to get it right. And I asked this team to use its position of influence and consequence to make difference in the lives of students, faculty, and professional staff. And we came together as a district administration, and uh, overall, all of the leaders across the district uh, had a retreat at the district office, and we developed the administrative standards of excellence. And that is, what standards of excellence do the faculty, staff, and community have a right to have access to in their, in their administration? Uh, and then we have to, and, and we adopted that, and now we have to see how does that play out. So I'll give you an example. Let's say one of the standards is about responsiveness and service. For me, what that means is a document doesn't sit on my desk more than two days for a signature. So imagine if that's adopted throughout this district. Now, that's a simplistic example. But it's a very real example that impacts lives. And that comes to mind because I, when I came to Peralta in November, I signed a document that I saw had started in August. And it took four months for it to get up the 580, across the hall, and to my desk. And it's not because anybody is doing anything un uh, intentionally mean or not being of service. It has anything to do with our practices and our processes to vacant positions where there is not a person to process that purchase order that you think you asked for four months ago. So there's a lot of work that we'll be doing, but in doing so, we're doing so adhering to some standards of excellence. It's incorporated in the job descriptions and it's incorporated in the evaluations of the leadership team. So every job description that you see go out where we're recruiting people, they will have to make a commitment to those standards of excellence. So, what's the vision? I have a vision for Peralta, but the reality is we're going through a strategic plan and others may have a vision as well. And there may be some really great ideas, and especially because you've been here in Peralta and you know Peralta and you know this community, you're gonna be able to perfect this vision uh, or shift it or modify it. But here's what I'm thinking. First of all, my vision for Peralta is that it, the colleges in this district are models of excellence, models of academic excellence and models of professionalism with an excellent reputation. So when somebody says Peralta Community College District or when somebody says Berkeley City College, Laney College, College of Alameda, Merritt College, that in saying that, it automatically conjures up that good reputation, that model of excellence. We'll have a lot to do to get there. My vision is that this is a great place to live and work. And what that means is we resolve a lot of the issues that the faculty and staff and administration are well paid, that we have a kind of culture of respect and belonging where people want to be here and enjoy being here and that we're responsive to the community and we translate those community needs and demands into relevant programs and services that get them there. That this could be a great place to work. My vision is that we become a major source of social and cultural capital for the communities. There are communities all around that have all kinds of social and cultural capital. You know, Palo Alto will tell you every day they got Stanford. These communities, commonly communities that don't enjoy that kind of social and cultural capital, deserve to have access to that. We could be that. 
for these communities, where they look to Peralta Community College and are glad that we are part of their service and see us as a social institution, educational institution, that is part of meeting their needs. <clears throat> And my vision is that we become an economic engine for this community. That means that we will be looking at different programs and services. So for an example, we have one of the colleges has one job place center in the entire district. I know we have career services and those types of things. But job placement is critical, not only because the community needs to have access to job placement, but because also it's one of the drivers in your, in your funding formula and the students deserve, access to the, deserve to have access to that service, and we deserve to get the resources from the state in order to provide that service. So that's, those are little examples of how we will do certain things toward a greater vision of being the economic engine for this community. My vision is that we are a cultural center for the members of this community that are typically denied having access to a cultural seminar. The things that are going on on these campuses are amazing. The speakers, the activities, the events are amazing. And we need to make sure that the community has access to them and knows about them. So as we go through our strategic planning processes or you go through your files or you go through your, your Rolodex in your mind, if you have ideas about what this district could be, what these colleges to be, please do inform the strategic planning process so that we can make sure that those visions are realized. It is going to take all of us to get to where we want to go. The key thing is that we have to have some notion of where that is, and more so, we have to have the willingness to get there. With you, it is beyond possible. It is inevitable. I hope that you have a great flex day today and tomorrow, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the semester. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Stroud.